Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're so glad to see y'all in the house of the Lord this morning. We want to make some proclamations today. Let's sing it, y'all. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past are broken at last I got saved, oh I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of Jesus So lost till I fell at the cross and God saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. I could have won. and gentlemen, my name is Terry, and I'm your worship attendant this morning. On behalf of Brother Doug and the entire crew, welcome to First Baptist Church. Please pay attention to the screen as Suzanne gives visual instructions concerning our sanctuary procedures. We ask that you buckle your seatbelts. Oh, wait, we don't have seatbelts. Since we are not a registered aircraft under FAA guidelines, your seats cannot be used as a flotation device. To avoid any in-service confusion, please remain in your assigned seats until you receive further instructions later in the service. Should you need to go to the restroom, the restrooms are located in the front foyer. For your safety, please follow the instructions for exiting. Don't forget the offering boxes located at the front and back of the sanctuary. If you would, please note the camera located on the wall on my right, but your left. This will serve as the middle of the sanctuary. The rows in front of the wall-mounted camera will exit through the doors next to the piano and organ side. 
The rows behind the wall-mounted camera will exit through the front doors on the Devro side. Thank you for joining us today. We are looking forward to seeing you on board again soon. Good morning, church. We thought that would be a, a little humorous way to start out this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we are so thankful for who you are, and we're thankful for salvation. We're thankful for salvation in Jesus, and we praise you for that this morning. Be with Derek as he leads us in music, and Brother Doug as he opens your word and, and preaches to us today. Prepare our hearts to receive your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey girls, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Heather and Gabrielle and Kim, I'm so glad you're here. My question for you guys is what difference has God made in your life? What difference has Jesus made in your life? So Heather, can you tell us um, what you think about that? Well, um, I've known Jesus longer than I've known almost anybody else in my life. Uh, except for like my parents. I was 14 when I was baptized. So I've had over 20 years to grow as a Christian and I've probably done the most growing in the last five years. Um, and I have noticed that over the last five years I've become more humble, uh, more forgiving of others, um, very appreciative of my family and my church family and the, my health. Um, and he has shown me that there are other things that are more important in life than the window dressings of life, so to speak. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive. It doesn't matter what kind of house you live in. What matters is what's in your heart. Um, and the prize at the end of this will be, you know, spending eternity with the Lord. So. I love that. Thanks. What about you, Gabrielle? What difference has Jesus made in your life? Um, well, I feel like I've grown up, um, I'm a preacher's daughter, so I've grown up knowing him. And um, I'd say I truly, like Heather said, I truly didn't fully get into his word um, since over the past, the last five years, I think, about. Um, we, when we joined, Derek and I, um, we got married in 2015, and um, I knew that I was living in sin, and it, I wasn't walking right with the Lord, and I mean, he just, since then, he really opened my eyes to a lot different, I mean, it's just amazing at the blessings, and I told myself, I can't let my family walk down that road, and you know just grow them up and i've been in church all my life i have to be that role model and um my husband as well but um he really just opened my eyes and truly what a blessing he has done for me and my family just uh getting into the word and um when we joined first baptist y'all welcomed us with open arms and it's truly literally it's been wonderful amazing and I mean I could go on and on how the number of blessings that um, he's provided us with and just he's a huge difference maker if you truly study his word and I mean it's all there so awesome all right Kim what do, what about you what difference has Jesus made in your life well, uh, one of the differences that I think that he's made in my life is um, that he has given me courage to be myself, um, you know, and fully be fully accepted uh, for who I am in him. And, um, you know, as you look around and the world has no problem telling you, you know, what you should be doing or who you should be or what uh, cause you should be supporting. Um, but with Jesus, you know, kind of being your compass and being my compass, you know, he gives me the confidence to walk um, in the right path and at the risk of looking totally different from the rest of the crowd, you know. Um, and that to me, um, it just 
gives me the, the courage and the, um, what's the word? Um, oh, I can't think of the word, but, um, just, just being settled in yourself and, and, um, being confident. So. Awesome. Ladies, thank you so much for taking the time to come and tell us about what Jesus has done in your life. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I am so thankful in a world of inconsistency that our God is constant and he is always there. So thanks again, girls. Amen. I'm a living witness that he will change your life completely. Now, the scripture says that if we, um, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. I want you all to pray with me. I have a desire that I found out a secret today. We were doing this song in practice, and we got to a part in the song, and I had the whole band stop playing, and Brother Doug sang the part that was next. Brother Doug can sing. I want you all to pray that my desire is that he joins us on a quartet song. Is that cool? Gwinnett's not even looking up. She's just looking down like you are crazy. Let's sing this together. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, yes. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into
Amen, and good morning, church. We welcome you to the house of the Lord. Thank you for joining us for worship on this Independence Day weekend. We have so many freedoms here in our nation, but the greatest freedom is all is the freedom that comes to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you should be free indeed. In the book of 1 Peter, Peter reminds his readers about all the freedoms and blessings that are theirs as a result of trusting Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord. For the past few months, we've been engaged in expository sermons from this biblical book. And today we come to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where Peter writes, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God. excited about our salvation today from darkness to light twas a life filled with aimless desperation without hope walk the shell of a man In a hand with a nail print stretched downward just one touch then a new life began In a life 
praise band and praise team for leading us in worship this morning. The winner of five Grammy Awards and two Dove Awards, Billy Joe Thomas, better known as B.J. Thomas, was born in Hugo, Oklahoma in the year 1942. Some of the songs for which he is best known include Hooked on a Feeling, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, I Just Can't Help Believing, and Hey, Won't You Play Another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong song. Although his professional career started out well, it wasn't long until B.J.'s personal life became a mess. As was true of so many professional entertainers, B.J. Thomas became addicted to both drugs and alcohol. In an interview, he admitted taking more than 80 pills a day, primarily Valium and amphetamines, and at one point stayed awake and wired for 11 consecutive days. B.J.'s drug of choice was cocaine. He became seriously addicted to this white powder. In his autobiography, Home Where I Belong, B.J. relates how at one point he was spending thousands of dollars each week to support his habit. His downward spiral continued until he ended up, in his own words, broke, busted, disgusted, and stripped of all self-confidence. Well, fortunately, everything changed on January the 26th, 1975, when B.J. Thomas met two missionaries who had led his wife Gloria to the Lord. In a long conversation, they shared the gospel with him, and B.J. Thomas prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. A few months later, I had an opportunity to hear B.J. as he performed a concert. And during the course of this concert, he shared his personal testimony and then related that he'd like to sing a song. He didn't write this song, and he was not the first to record it, but the song described the difference that the Lord had made in his life. And the song is entitled, What a Difference You've Made in My Life. I'm sure many of you remember the lyrics. What a difference you've made in my life. What a difference you've made in my life. You're my sunshine day and night. Oh, what a difference you've made in my life. What a change you've made in my heart. What a change you've made in my heart. You've replaced all the broken parts. Oh, what a change you've made in my heart. Love to me was just a word in a song that had been way overused. But now I've joined the singing because you've shown me life's true meaning. That's why I want to spread the news. What a difference you've made in my life. What a difference you've made in my life. You're my sunshine day and night. Oh, what a difference you've made in my life. Well, in today's text, Simon Peter, one of our Lord's original 12 disciples, shared with his readers about the difference the Lord had made in their lives. And this morning, I want to share with you three major points from these two verses. Let's begin by considering the reminder, the reminder. Now, throughout this passage, Peter repeatedly reminds his readers of the difference the Lord had made in their lives. And one of the ways he did so was comparing and contrasting what life was like before they met Christ and now what life was like after they met Jesus. If you were here last Sunday morning, you may recall that I preached from the previous paragraph, and Peter talked about the fact that Jesus was the stone, the chief cornerstone, and then he related how some had received him and some had rejected him. This is what Peter wrote. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So Peter is saying, what you do with the stone, what you do with Jesus, makes all the difference in the world. There's a different decision. Some people choose to receive Jesus. Some choose to reject Jesus. And what you do with Jesus changes everything. There are new desires. Prior to trusting Jesus, your, your desire was to please yourself or to please other people. But now when you trust Jesus, you want to please him. You're just not out there trying to get somebody to pat you on the back or compliment you. But one day you want to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's a different decision, different desires. There's a different direction. Prior to meeting the Lord, you were going in the wrong direction. You were living in sin regardless of what you were doing. But when you met Jesus, your life turned around and you started living for the Savior. And then there's a different destination. Peter said those who stumbled, those who did not receive the stone, those who rejected him, have nothing to look forward to when it comes to eternity because they will be separated from God. But those of you who are Christians have the hope of 
heaven. So Peter reminds them there's a difference. In verse 10, he goes on to say, once you were not a people of God, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter was saying, just remember, there's a time in your life when you were not the people of God. You were not children of God. But now everything is different. Once you were hopeless, but now you have hope. Once you were lost, but now you are saved. Once you were just a creation of God, but now you are a child of God. I often hear people talking about everybody's a child of God. And I want to correct that today. Not every person is a child of God. Every person is a creation of God. Every life is special in God's sight. But you only become a child of God when you are born again into the family of God. That's when you are saved, and that's when God becomes your heavenly Father. And so once you receive Jesus, everything in life changes. Uh, we have to sometimes be reminded of what life was like before we met the Lord to truly appreciate what it means to be saved. Do you ever take time just to look back in your rearview mirror and just be reminded of what life was like without Jesus? And now the hope and the blessing you have because you have come to know the Lord as your Savior is hard to improve on the words of John Newton that he wrote in the, in the hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And that's your story, and that's my story. We were lost, but now we're found. We were blind, but now we see. And what we should see is that we have a bright and blessed future. In spite of the darkness going on in the world around us today, we have the light of Jesus in our lives, and we know that when we leave this world, we have the hope of heaven. Now, the title I've chosen for this series of sermons is God's Gold Mine, Spiritual Nuggets from 1 Peter. The subtitle is An Epistle of Encouragement. And so in today's text, Peter is encouraging his readers, saying, just remember the difference the Lord has made in your life. Lift up your head. You have hope. And then he goes on to offer some additional encouragement with a second point, and that is the rewards, the rewards. After he reminds his readers about the difference the Lord's made in his life, he begins verse 9 with the word but, but underscoring the difference, but your life is now different, and your life has been rewarded by the Lord. And he begins to point out some of these rewards. First of all, he says, but you are a chosen people. If you're following your copy of the Word of God, you'll see that everything I'm sharing this morning comes straight from the Scripture. You are a chosen people. Now, it's interesting to note that the concept of God choosing people and God electing people it's something that Peter returns to over and over again. In fact, please be reminded of how Peter began this epistle. He said, to God's elect. And the people to whom he was writing had an understanding of what it meant to be God's chosen people. This concept of God's elect and chosen people has roots that run deep within the pages of the Old Testament. In fact, listen to what the book of Deuteronomy says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. You are God's chosen people. And the people who live in the first century A.D. could think back on Hebrew history and be reminded of how God had blessed his chosen people. God had blessed them with his presence. He had blessed them with his protection and with his provisions. Go back and you be reminded of the Exodus, how God sent Moses down into Egypt to lead his people out of slavery. They had served as slaves for 430 years. And now Moses, acting as God's ambassador, leads them to freedom. And throughout that process, God was with the Israelites. He guided them with a pillar of cloud and fire. When they came to the banks of the sea, and Pharaoh's army began to pursue them. It was God who sent a wind to, to part the waters and allow the Israelites to cross on dry land, thus protecting them from their enemies. When the Israelites were hungry, God gave them manna from heaven and even gave them quail to eat. When they were thirsty, God gave them water from a rock. God had always been there blessing them and meeting their needs. And the concept Peter wanted his readers to understand is what God had done for the ancient Israelites, he will do for you because you two are God's chosen people. And by extension, this same promise is given to us because we are God's chosen people. At the moment of our salvation, 
we become God's chosen people. And I want you to know that God will always be with you. Jesus said, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. The Lord will, will meet every need in your life. He'll protect you. You are blessed. The war, first reward, Peter says, you are a chosen people. But then he says, you're also a royal priesthood. Not just a priesthood, but a royal priesthood. And this royalty stems from the fact that the king of glory has taken up residence in your life. Paul put it this way in the book of Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think it's an amazing thought, an awesome thought, that the God who spoke our world into being actually comes to live within our lives. He takes up permanent residence in our hearts when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord. We become a royal priesthood. The function of a priest was to represent God to man and man to God. And God has, has given us rewards, not simply so we can be blessed, but so that we can be a blessing. And one of the ways we do so is by being a priest, by being God's representatives here on earth. I, I think it's imperative that we consciously determine that we're going to be good representatives of the Lord. That means our character, our choices, our conduct, and our conversations all need to honor the Lord. So I want you to take a moment today just to reflect upon your life. How are you doing as a royal priest? How are you representing the Lord at home, at work, in social settings? Are you representing the Lord the way you should? Peter says, listen, listen, Christian, you are a royal priest. Don't forget that. Be a good representative of the Lord. And then he says, you are a holy nation. A holy nation. The word holy means to separate or set apart. To be separate from and to be separate for. Be separate from sin and be separate for the Savior. You are to be a different people. Different from those who are lost. And you are to be a nation. It is your mutual faith in Jesus Christ that brings you together as one nation. Now, Keep in mind that Peter is not addressing one local church. Neither is he addressing one specific group of people who are located in one geographical setting. Peter is speaking to people who have been scattered. In the introduction to this book, we see that he's addressing people in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But all these believers have the common denominator of their faith in Jesus Christ. And the Lord is saying to them, right now, you are to be a holy nation you are my people coming together to serve me and represent me on planet Earth. And these words continue to ring out and be true of us today. Christians in this country are to be a holy nation that we are to come together and that we are living in such a way that we point people to the Lord and they begin to recognize the difference that Jesus can make in one's life. But it's not enough to simply repeat a line in a pledge, one nation under God, or to put the motto, in God we trust, on our currency. Today, on this Independence Day weekend, can we just be honest and say that we are not a holy nation? Look at what's going on in our nation today. When you turn on the news, you see not only peaceful protests, you see rioting and looting. You see the disrespect for law enforcement personnel. In recent years, the United States Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled in ways that are contrary to the Word of God in issues such as marriage and the sanctity of human life. I'm not sure we've ever truly been a holy nation, but we're probably less holy today than we were a couple of decades ago. We've taken prayer out of our public schools. We've said it's illegal to place nativity scenes on public property. We've removed the Ten Commandments from the courtroom, and we wonder why our world and our nation is in a mess today. On this Independence Day weekend, we want to sing, God Bless America. And he has. But a more accurate song should be, God have mercy on America. And you and I better pray that he does. Amen? Because our nation is in a mess. We are called to be a holy nation. 
And we are rewarded when we are a holy nation. You say, well, Pastor, how do you say that? I say it based on the promise of the Scripture in Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord and the people he has chosen for his own inheritance. Peter says, listen, church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people belonging to God. Verse 10 says, there was a time when you were not a people of God, but now you are the people of God. You belong to the Lord. And when I was reading this line, I was reminded of an old hymn we used to sing many years ago entitled, Now I Belong to Jesus. And if you're a Christian, you do. And the reason why you belong to the Lord is that you have been bought. Paul says to the church in Corinth, he says, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Let me tell you, God paid a huge price to own us. He bought us with the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus. Now I belong to Jesus. Now I'm a person of God. And I need to live in such a way that people see Jesus living in me. It's a blessing, but it's a challenge. Then there's a, a third point I would call your attention today. Not just a reminder and the rewards, but the reason. And this too comes straight out of Scripture. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. There's a reason for the reminder. There's a reason for the rewards. And that reason is we are to proclaim the power of God. The Greek term is the excellencies of God, which means that God is powerful, that God is able, and he is capable of changing our world. From a human perspective, I'm just being honest with you this morning, I don't want to be a pessimist, but from a human perspective, I don't see much hope for America. But with God, there is hope, and he is the only one who can turn things around. But you and I have been challenged with a responsibility. We've received the responsibility. We've been given the assignment. It's in our job description to proclaim the goodness of God, to proclaim the grace of God, to, to proclaim the greatness of God, and how God can still save America. Jesus can make a difference in our lives. He can make a difference in our country. And we desperately need the Lord today. I shared with you earlier that B.J. Thomas' life was on a downward spiral. He said, I was broke, busted, disgusted, and stripped of all self-confidence. It is with a broken heart I tell you that America is on a downward spiral this morning. And without the Lord, we're going to be broke and busted. Those of us who know the Lord had better start making him known so that there can be hope for America. I believe that one person can make a difference. I believe that one church can make a difference. I believe that together we can make a difference in our nation. But first, we have to allow the Lord to make a difference in our lives. What a difference you've made in my life. What a difference you've made in my life. You're my sunshine day and night. Oh, what a difference you've made in my life. I wish I could relate to you this morning that once B.J. Thomas was saved, that, that everything was wonderful and he never stumbled again. But the fact of the matter is, like most alcoholics and addicts, B.J. relapsed a couple of times along the way. But you know, this morning I'm speaking to some relapsed people, to some relapsed Christians. Because there have been moments in our lives when we were living for Jesus, we were dedicated and serving the Lord, and at some point in time, many of us have kind of just relapsed. We relapsed by relaxing our commitment to Christ. But today, we need to stop relaxing and start renewing our commitment to the Lord so He can make a difference in our lives and use us to make a difference in this world, starting right here in America. America needs the Lord. We have Him. 
I pray we'll share him in such a way that others might find hope. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. In just a moment, our instruments are going, to, are going to play, and I want you just to thank the Lord for the difference he's made in your life. I say thank you, God, that I'm no longer bound for hell, that I've got a home in heaven. And ask the Lord what other differences he would like to make in your life this morning. Or maybe how he would like to use your life to make a difference in someone else's life. You just be open to the Lord during this time of reflection. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I uh, want to remind you as you leave, there's an offering box in the front foyer as well as the foyer t uh, to my left, your right as you exit this morning. And we want to let you know that if you want more information about our church, if you need to make a decision about following Christ, we also have ministers available in the reception room as you leave this morning. And as you leave, remember that if you're sitting in the middle or using this camera as the middle of the room, if you're sitting in the front, if you're on this side, you can exit out the piano. On this side, exit out the organ. If you're in the back, then you exit out the back doors this morning. Thank you for joining us for worship, and you are dismissed. <laughs>